Hallelujah. Well, happy Mother's Day. Yeah. So Vernie asked me if I would give the Mother's Day sermon, and I said yes, and then I went, <laughs> um, Because, you know, there's lots of pressure on a Mother's Day sermon because there's extra people in church. That's, you know, next to Easter and Christmas. That's when most, more, most visitors visit the church is, uh, for the Mother's Day service. So, so here we have pressure, you know, which is the definition of motherhood. I think. <laughs> and when you come to a church service on Mother's Day, you're going to hear three different messages, basically. The first one you're going to hear is, mothers are great, God loves mothers, look at Mary. <laughs> yeah. that, or or you, the other one you might hear is, mothers are great, but you can do better, look at Mary. You know? And, you know, when, you know, we wouldn't even know who Mary was if it wasn't for Jesus. Mary would have been this little, little Jewish girl in Israel. No one ever would have heard of her except for her son. And, you know, a lot of the famous women that we know in the world, we know them because they're mothers of famous men. And so... Women are important, and women are wonderful, and God does love women. Um, and, and that would be a great message, but it's not exactly where I'm going to go, because I'm going to go more for the third option, the third sermon you might hear, where the pastor gets up and honors women, and then they preach about what they want to talk about. <laughs> and so I'm going to do a little bit of everything for you guys today. I am going to talk about mothers because mothers are important. Man, you know, it's the mother really that shapes the home. You know, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> so, and it's mothers that have major influence on their children. And we see that in the word. There are all kinds of examples of mothers. And I could point to, I could point to Hannah. You know, Hannah it was a childless mother, you know, who yearned for a child. And out of her love for God, you know, she requested that. I mean, that's a wonderful example. You know, but there are all kinds of mothers in the world. There are motherless. There are, there are childless mothers. There are mothers who have lost their children. There are mothers out there whose children are estranged from them. You know, there are mothers out there who have just really messed up. And so... For, and there are mothers like me who maybe haven't messed up, but man, half the time you think you have. And so Mother's Day, you know, it's great. I could sit here and tell you how wonderful mothers are, but I can remember sitting and listening to sermons about how wonderful mothers are, and I just felt like that was not me. <laughs> no. I'm being honest with you, you know. I think half the time mothers are struggling, wondering if they're doing the job well. Praying, God, just make, let me do the job well. Let this child turn out okay. Let him be happy. Let him not be an axe murderer. <laughs> if you know my son Mark, you know that I prayed that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, um, you know, and then, you know, so, so we hear sermons about how to do better, you know, five steps toward being a better mother. And, and all that does is just leave us frustrated, you know, trying to go after something that, that God never intended for us to go after. So, you know, so often we look at all those examples in the Old Testament and we think, well, this is how to be a better mother. This is what I need to be like. You know what? God never called you to be like anyone else. He made you an individual. He, he, made you the best you that you are. And so God doesn't want you to be like Mary. He doesn't want you to be like Moses' mother. He doesn't want you to be like Bathsheba. He doesn't want you to be like any of those women he, or men. He wants you to be you. So we're learning on Wednesday nights how to look at things differently in Scripture. And so 
Today, what I decided I would do was rather than look and see how to be a better mother or how to be the perfect mother, I want to look at the mothers of the Bible and I want to look and see how God reveals himself in the mothers in the Bible. Because really, what, you know, uh, you know, people get so funny, you know, no, it, because God is God the Father. But we forget that God the Father said, let us make, ma let, let us make man in our image. And then it said, male and female, he created him, them. And so women are also made in the image of God. God said there's no difference between male or female, you know, Jew or Greek. We're all one in his sight. And so there are aspects of women that are aspects of the Father God. And so we'll look at a few of those in the Bible. God reveals himself as a nurturer. You know, we don't really look at fathers in that aspect. You know, normally fathers are, we look at them as the provider and the, and the warrior, uh, but we don't often talk about God the nurturer and God with the tender heart. But that's who he is, and that's how he describes himself. If you go to Deuteronomy 32, 11, God gives a picture of how he wants us to view him. Deuteronomy 32, 11. It says, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on his pinions. So this is a picture of God the Father, an eagle on her nest, stirring up the nest, keeping them warm, providing for them, you know, and, and as they're learning how to fly, you know, the, the mother eagle will, will actually kick them out of the nest and then swoop under them and lift them up, you know, until they get it. <laughs> you know, and that's the God's picture for us. That's how he views us. He is that mother eagle providing, protecting, providing the nest, feeding us. Those baby birds, they, there's no way for them to get food unless their mother brings it to them. And, you know, feathering the nest with her own feathers and then bearing them up on her wings. And that's how God views, he views us as eaglets, you know, young eagles preparing us to soar. Isn't that wonderful? That's a picture God gives us of himself. And he, here's another one. I, I, I probably am going to go to this one. Let me see. It's in Isaiah 49, verse 15. Whoops, then I grabbed the wrong one. So Isaiah 49, um, 15. i got to be smarter than the machine, people. All right. Here we go, 49, 15. And this, this is so beautiful. The Lord's speaking. He said, Can a mother forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they forget, yet will I not forget thee. See, God is faithful even when we are faithless. And you know what? Even in, when we seem to have forgotten God, he has not forgotten us. I don't care how far you think you've run away from God, he is there. He goes with you. And God, the way he feels towards you is, would a mother forget the baby at her breast? Would a mother forget her newborn baby? And of course, the rhetorical answer is no. 
And God describes himself that way. I will not forget you. That's the promise we have from God. How wonderful is that? God's heart towards his children is like the heart of a, of a mother who has a newborn. And there is nothing fiercer than that. That, that's, that love is uh, beyond. That's how God describes himself. And then in Isaiah 66, verse 13, I want to go to that too. He describes himself again in these terms. He says, As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Now, if we go back a couple of verses, this is what it's talking about in verse 10. Rejoice ye with Israel, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her, that ye may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolations, that ye may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, ye shall be born upon her side, and be dang dangled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. Can you get the picture God has? He's a, a picture of his heart is a mother dangling the kids on her knees. Have you ever sat in the chair and done that? I about ruined this knee with Jackson, I tell you. I mean... Um, doing that because he's heavy and you know but I do that I play with the grandkids I dangle them on my knee and play and that's God's picture that he's showing us of his heart he'll comfort us like a mother dangling a child on her knee you know like a mother how does a, a mother comforts her child she rocks that child she holds that child close this is God's picture for us of how he views us, how much he loves us, how much of a mother's heart he has. That's, God is wonderful that way. And then in Jesus revealed that mother's heart too in Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus is looking over the city of Jerusalem, and he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. See, how does God talk to Jerusalem? He said, you've killed the prophets. You've murdered the ones who have been sent. And despite that, I would still have gathered you under my wings like a, a hen gathers her chicks. Despite how awful you think you are, despite the bad things you've done, I will still gather you under my wings if you'll just come. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I grew up on the farm, and we had bandy hens. We had bandy chickens. And those things are fierce, but they were fun to watch. They'd have all these little multicolored eggs, and then they would have all these multicolored chicks, every, every color and pattern. And you would see that mother hen, she'd be all fluffed up, and they're small birds. They're not like a, a white leghorn chicken. You know, they're small little feisty birds. And you would see that mother, she would puff up her feathers all around, and she might have 20 chicks under there. And every now and then you'd see one peek out. You know, they'd peek out. But believe me, nobody came near, because she would take you out. You know? And that's God's heart towards his children. 
believe me, no one's going to take you out. Nobody's going to come against you. God is like that bandage hen protecting her chicks under her wings. And in another place in Hosea, God describes that same kind of fierceness. He describes himself as a bear who's grieving for her cubs. That's the kind of, you know, anger God can feel towards someone who comes against his children. And he describes himself as a lioness, not a lion, but a lioness. That fierce protective heart, you know. God was the original of Mama Grizzly Bear. <laughs> So we can look at these people, we can look at these things, we can look at Moses' mother who was willing to give up, who put her child into the water and trusted that God would keep him safe and God rewarded that faith. It's a beautiful picture. And you know what, that's what God did when he sent Jesus. He put him into this world and trusted that the plan would work out. And it did. God reveals himself as having a mother's heart. And, you know, Bob talked about Proverbs 31. And I want to look at that, too. Because I've talked about Proverbs 31. You guys know I used to hate this chapter. Absolutely hated it. Because I saw this as a description <coughs> of who that perfect woman was, and I was not her. <laughs> you, know, you know, but, you know, I've been looking at that chapter and looking at that chapter, and I want to show you a little different something, okay, about Proverbs 31. And I would submit to you that it's not talking about the perfect wife at all. Okay. Proverbs 31 comes at the, it's the last book of Proverbs. And what is the book of Proverbs about? The book of Proverbs is about wisdom. Every chapter is about wisdom. And David tells, or, um, yeah, King David tells his son Solomon, seek wisdom, get understanding. Above all else, get wisdom. In all your seeking, seek wisdom. In fact, wisdom is described in um, Proverbs. No, don't tell me I don't have it right now. Proverbs one twenty through twenty three. Wisdom crieth out without; she uttereth her voice in the streets. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make my words known unto you. Wisdom is described as a woman. And when we go into Proverbs 31, which I would look at and say, this is the summation of the book of Proverbs. This is the words, oh, that's, that went to the wrong place. It jumped ahead. So, ah, I hate it when the, um, Proverbs 31, 1, there we go. Now the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So this was taught to some, Lemuel was a, you know, pet name for Samuel, some say. And this is what his mother taught him. What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my bowels. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. You know, and there's some wisdom here. Then we go forward, and then he talks, and she talks in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? See, I'm, I'm going to submit to you, this isn't talking about a woman at all. This is talking about wisdom. 
the same wisdom that cried out in the street, the same wisdom that's going to pour out its spirit on all flesh. And we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And I submit to you that Jesus came to fulfill this too. Ha, ha, ha. Jesus came and fulfilled this. Because Jesus has become unto us, in Corinthians 1.13, it says, But of him are ye in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30, sorry. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus has been made our wisdom. And then again in Ephesians 1.17 it says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so now when we're going to read Proverbs 31, we're going to read about Jesus. We're going to read about our wisdom that is given to us. Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find wisdom? Remember, over and over, David said, Seek wisdom. Above all things, get understanding. His mother is saying, Who can find that virtuous woman? Her, the heart of her husband doth trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle does not go out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hands to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She maketh herself a covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is wisdom. Wisdom is doing all of these things, and our wisdom is Jesus. Jesus is the one who's going to be praised at the gates. Jesus is the one who provides for us, Jesus is the one who, who gives us the wisdom that we need to raise our kids and be the mothers that we need to be. See, I'm not going to stand up here and give you a sermon about, you know, about Mary, although we honor her as the mother of Jesus. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you how you can be a better mother because, you know, I'm still working on this thing. But I do have a message, I do have a verse that's for every mother here today. <clears throat> because I know what it's like when you go home and for me when the kids are gone, when Randy's not there, and I'm stuck looking at my house. <laughs> this is the verse I need to hear. This is the verse every mother needs to keep in mind. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. 
There is therefore now no condemnation. There's no condemnation for the sink full of dirty dishes. There's no condemnation for the dirty bedrooms. There's no condemnation for the unmade bed or the pile of laundry or the vacuum that sits useless. There's no condemnation for the child who's gone astray. There's no condemnation for the 20 extra pounds. There's no condemnation for even the negative thoughts you think about yourself. There is therefore no condemnation towards you from your Father God who understands you because he has your heart. He has the heart of a mother. He understands. He came. He was tempted with every temptation that we are tempted with. He was tempted to believe negative things about himself. He was tempted to feel condemnation. He was tempted to feel guilt. He was tempted to, to give in to shame. He was tempted to run away. Oh, man. Do you ever, women, do you ever just want to walk out the door and never come back? You know, maybe you guys don't know this happens, but believe me, it does. You know what? There's no condemnation for that. God doesn't condemn you for any of those thoughts. He doesn't condemn you for the marriage that failed. He doesn't condemn you for the mistakes you made. He doesn't condemn you for the choices you made. He does not condemn. He came to save you. He came to comfort you. He came to dangle you on his knee and wrap you in a bear hug and pat your shoulder and say, there, there, it's okay. Daddy's here. So that's the message for mothers today. Real simple, short message today, but the message is there is no condemnation towards you. No condemnation from your father. And because he condemns you, don't condemn yourself. It's just like he said to the woman, woman, where are your condemners? Where are your accusers? And she said, there's no one. Who accuses you? There's no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you then. And that's what God would say to you. There's, who are your accusers? There's no one. Because the only one who has a right to accuse you of anything is God himself. And he won't. He won't. He took the condemnation himself. And so in those times when you're tempted to feel less than you are, don't. Because Jesus Christ has made you holy and righteous and blessed. He sees you as holy and righteous and pure as Jesus Christ himself. He looks at you and he sees only the child that he loves. He sees that suckling baby at his breast. And he will never forget you. He will never forget you. He will always be faithful. And because we have his love, we can walk freely. Amen. You can walk freely. <clears throat> let the weight of the shame, let the weight of the sin, let the weight of those cares, let them fall. Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And God will never condemn you. He will never upbraid you. He will never embarrass you. He will never put you to shame because he has the heart of a mother. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us. We thank you that you put in your word the exciting news that you have the heart of a mother, that you'll never forget us, 
that you love us fiercely, that you're like a grizzly bear defending us, and yet you're tender as a mother with her newborn baby. And we give you praise, Father, that you help us as mothers and fathers and people to walk free, free from condemnation, free from shame, free from the hurt of the past, free from negative thoughts, free from anxiety, free because you love us. Help us feel that love, Father, and help us share that love with others. In Jesus' name, we ask now, Father, you'll be present with us as we eat at this meal that we share together. Bless the fellowship, Father. That's what you do so well. And we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.